Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining for our fourth session for today's Yes Speaker Series. We're about halfway through the day. Uh, lots of great content still to come. Uh, today we're joined by Nu Gote, who will share a talk on reimagining the role of the designer. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that George Brown College is on the land Sorry, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which George Brown College is situated is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and other Indigenous people who have lived on this land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. Across the School of Design, we remain committed to identifying and removing systemic barriers to accessing college programs and services, and are committed to identifying strategies, tools, and actions to better support our Indigenous student population. In a commitment to build connections and opportunities for students to engage with design's visionaries, YES features a week-long lecture series, 18 to be exact. The design-focused speaker series has been cultivated in an effort to provide dynamic perspectives and unique discussion opportunities for members of our community, including students and faculty alike. Honest advice for designers from really good designers connects the School of Design with those who have impacted the industry on a local and global scale. We encourage you to ask any questions you have for new in the YouTube chat. As part of this week's activities, we have a series of giveaways and I'm happy to give away a copy of Dean Journal, which is incredible. If you haven't yet checked it out, you should. Um, New is largely responsible for it. The latest issue on Dean uh, goes to the first person who signed up for today's session. And that is uh, graphic design faculty member Shira Zwanya, um, who teaches in both graphic design and art and design foundation. Congratulations, Shiraz. With that, I would like to introduce Nu Gote, who is a multidisciplinary creative and designer who works in audio, visual, and written mediums. He's the co-founder of the strategy and design studio Room for Magic, uh, perfect name, and co-founder and creative director of the partner publication, Deem Journal. Additionally, Nu is a professor at Parsons School of Design, leading a course entitled Design Dichotomies, which explores the appropriate scale of humanitarian initiatives with a specific focus on values and the market. News practice is informed by his love for counter and subcultures. His background is a Liberian born refugee and a lifelong dedication to building platforms that enable communities to engage in shared experiences. Holding a master's in strategic design and management from Parsons School of Design, New is focused on the capabilities of design thinking and on investing in ideas that solve bigger problems as a means of elevating the well being of others. Based in Los Angeles, he has helped brands such as Puma, Red Bull, Sonos, Adidas, and Sesame Street, my favorite of all, improve upon the way people experience culture, community, and social capital. With an inherent understanding of the elements needed to build community platforms, New brings over a decade of branding, research, strategic development, ideation, and production to create equitable change to the way communities are being represented. Moderating the Q&A portion of today's session is graphic design graduate Zoran uh, Jovicic. I hope I said that right, Zoran. <laughs> With a background in marketing, he enjoys finding ways that merge the two worlds of design and strategic strategy together to create meaningful solutions. His current passion are typography, identity design, and creating work with his hands. Zoran's amazing thesis project is focused on using design to increase cross-cultural communication among the diverse cultural groups of the city, as done through a revival of the once successful Caravan Festival in Toronto. Welcome, Zoran. With that, I'm pleased to turn over to Nu, who will start his presentation. Hello, everyone. So my presentation is called Designing Design, which was inspired by one of my favorite design books, which is called Designing but Design by Kenya Hawa. Um, start off, my name is New. I think the intro was so thorough that I really don't have anything to add besides I am wearing the same jacket that is in the image right now. It's one of my favorite pieces to wear. Um, yeah, I'm a designer, educator, creative director. Um, many different hyphens go into it, but one of the most interesting things is I didn't always start off as a designer or I did not always consider myself um, a designer. My trajectory started in marketing in which I worked for a bunch of lifestyle brands and what I did and what I became really good at was selling products adding value and making products desirable. Um, I hit a wall, the dotted line is, on the left is the wall that I hit where I just was not satisfied with simply selling people 
products, I was more interested in trying to solve problems. Um, this was around the time of the murder of Trayvon Martin, and I really was starting to think, how could I play a much more integral role in the communities that I was part of and that wanted to engage with? That led me to leaving the world of marketing and actually start um, a journey into design. Um, and went to grad school at Parsons. I did a degree called Strategic Design and Management, and really, which helped me to hone in my skills on problem solving. But like most students, grad school was about to end, and then the dollar signs came in, aka how was I going to have a sustainable living um, based off of my new skill set that I had? And, and at that time, uh, I was in the third cohort of the program, and so strategic design and management, human-centered design, design thinking was a very buzzy word. It still is a very buzzy word, but it didn't really translate to a specific role. So I started seeking out opportunities to, to leverage my uh, research and design skills, and which led me to strategy. I took a strategic job. I took a job at an ad agency called AKQA, in which I started off as a senior strategist. By the time I left, I was a, a director of strategy. But really, what started to happen was that I went from selling products to selling ideas. I was using my ability to solve problems to actually. Um, so ideas in which that also didn't satisfy me because I still felt like I was in a selling mode. But an epiphany hit me, right? So the, the, last, the last dotted line was I realized that it wasn't about me moving away from selling. It was actually me combining my ability to sell and drive desirability and tell compel compelling stories to actually be able to solve problems. And that by combining the two, uh, actually, when I realized that the work that I do is truly rooted in design, and I've always been a designer, I just never thought of myself that way. And so now, in this current iteration of myself, I have many different practices that allow me to combine the ability to drive desirability, tell stories, um, create compelling narratives, um, with the ability to also make sure that that's rooted in adding value in solving problems. My two different babies that I'm currently currently growing um, on the left hand side, there's Room for Magic, and which is a studio which we do research and strategy and design in order in order to instigate equitable exchange, and that exchange is between communities and entities. And part of what we saw was that regardless of if it's an NGO or it's a soda brand, um, everyone is looking to be able to connect with a certain group of people, right? A certain community. But, but what we saw was that there wasn't really um, real true exchange between the entities and the communities. And oftentimes the, the communities did not have a way of really having a seat at the table. And so we operate in terms of being that in between. Um, and so often uh, a client will reach out to us because they wanna engage with a specific audience. And what we do is create either research or design engagements that will allow us to bring those audience members to the table and actually have a seat through the research uh, that we're doing. And so attached to that, is Deem Journal, in which Deem is our platform in which we are have the ambitious goal of democratizing the world of design, helping to reshape and refocus design, moving away from design purely based on outputs um, to design that's actually based on process. What we found that if you look at design purely based on outputs, um, it's also tied to fidelity, how finished and polished is the output in which fidelity is also tied to resources. And resources are not evenly distributed throughout the world through many different systems. And so what we've seen is that the only people who get to be designers are the people who have the resources to be designers. But we see that design is fundamentally a shared experience that everyone participates in 
And so our goal is starting to actually look at design through the lens of process in which in process you can become inspired, you can um, adopt, you can adapt. And there's many more people who are facilitating, participating in design that don't identify as designers when we look at design based off of process and not off of output. Uh, and so we created Deem, Room for Magic came first, It's a, um, and then we created Deem, Deem being a collaboration between Room for Magic and another design studio, Openbox. And last March, um, we had the opportunity to speak at um, a event with Space 10, in which Space 10 is a research um, and development incubator um, in Copenhagen. And we were invited by a good friend of ours, Lin Yi Ryan from Mold Magazine, in which she had the opportunity to speak about care. But this was also um, around the time of the murder of George Floyd. And she actually felt that her talk wasn't as relevant in that time, but wanted to invite um, Alice and I, Alice being my um, partner in both Room for Magic and, and Deem, to speak about the work that that we're doing and so yeah that was my first time um speaking i guess on a public forum and what was interesting about that was that that actually led to a lot of engagement from people who found um the concepts and even just the way we're approaching design to be compelling and to fill a void and one of the people who found that very compelling um, was the actual um, director of programming for industrial design at Parsons, the new school. And so this is an email from Yvette who reached out to me and she reached out to me at a very interesting time. I was going into a surgery and she reached out to me like maybe like a week before the surgery to ask me if I wanted to teach this class, right? This design dichotomy class. One of the faculty members attended the Space 10 talk and felt that I would be a good person to, to teach the class. The odd thing is I had never taught before. I, I have always wanted to teach. I had ambitions to teach, but never had the opportunity. And so once this opportunity presented itself, I jumped at it. I was excited. In which the theme of this talk is us unpacking how pedagogy and how teaching is a means of shaping design and the role of the designer. So the, the class, design dichotomies. I remember reading the description and it didn't really make sense to me. It wasn't really clear what the class was about, but I had signed up to teach it. I had signed up to teach it and I had, uh, I think maybe like two weeks to put together a syllabus. I had never put together a syllabus before. Um, and so I started off by just rereading the description many times and trying to make sense out of it. I found it to be very jargony and not very human, but I decided to take some things out, pull, pull it back a bit and start to look at it in its most purest essence. And what I started to see was a class that was about navigating um, contradictions, a class that was about exploring worldviews, a class that was about um, actually like interrogating the future, seeing what the future is, and looking at a design-led social change. All of those things really spoke to me, all those things really excited me, so I really decided to root the class in that. And really what the class ended up becoming was an exploration of the intersection of design and society, right? And looking at the core systems of economy, how are we managing resources, who are getting resources, looking at the environment, whether it's spaces that are built or spaces that are naturally out there, or sustainability, and then also equity. And what's interesting is that designers sit between all of these systems, but I don't think we often get an opportunity to actually engage with all these systems. And so part of the class was how do I start to center design in this either as a means of perpetuating or dismantling and rebuilding these systems. And one of the, the key themes that I, that I made sure was the foundation of the class was systems thinking. And what systems thinking 
isn't really to highlight the individual parts, but how the individual parts actually work together to reinforce themselves. And so with that, seeing where the designer actually plays a, a role in all of these systems and even in, in larger systems. And so the overall goals of the class <clears throat> was split into a couple of ways. One, it was helping students start to think to move away from the what to the why. Keep in mind, this was industrial design students who create objects. And so once we started moving away from the what, it's not what you're creating, but it's why. Why are we creating this? Why is this a solution? Why is this object um, the most optimal way <clears throat> to solve this problem? And then next, like actually going into context. So it's not just about what you're creating, but what is the context around what is being created, what is being designed, why is it adding value in the context that you're focused on, but also in the broader context. And then from there, being able to actually shape a point of view, right? Coming to the table with the actual point of view that's informed by the context, but also informed by the needs and wants and desires of the communities that you're engaging with. And then the next level is, okay, well now how do we communicate that point of view? How do you start to communicate and actually tell a story and a narrative that will make it as compelling as possible and also allow other people to adopt and feel um, inspired by it? And then lastly, and I feel like usual design, this is where this actually is first, is not how do we leverage all of this thinking to actually influence the output? So we don't even talk about the output until we fully understand why, we fully understand what's the broader context, and then we have our compelling point of view that we can communicate, and then we start to facilitate producing and manufacturing um, the output. In which for a lot of my students, this was a bit of a learning curve. And, <clears throat> and I prefaced the class by telling them everything that you have learned, we are going to unlearn and relearn and rebuild and starting. And, and with that, with the goal of moving away from just looking at outputs and looking at processes, it really started to help them think through their approach, but also be able to package and, and better sell um, their, their work in their other classes as well. And so speaking of packaging, and selling, I once again had to go back and figure out, okay, I had never written a syllabus before. Good thing is, and serendipitously, Lin Yi, who had brought us on for the um, Space 10 talk, also happened to be the co-teacher in the other section. And so there was already that connection. And I reached out to her to ask about, how do you write a syllabus? And she's like, well, here's my syllabus, take a look. Um, and let's collaborate on it. And so it was great to at least have that foundation. But one of my research tools that I used was Arena, <clears throat> in which I have an Arena board that, that's public called Designing Design. And I just started just collecting as much different types of materials that I felt could fit into the class as, as possible. And I kept it very broad, but this research phase allowed me to start to pull for some, some themes. One of the main things that really, really helped me um, was being able to find readers. So different design readers that were specifically meant to um, start to highlight different aspects of design that aren't usually highlighted. Because one of my goals was to start to move away from the traditional canon of design and actually start to make a design that could be a bit more inclusive. And what all the readers that I had collected um, really led me to was a, a buying frenzy. Um, I, was, I bought so many different books that really helped to start to inform and start to shape the way how the class um, came together. And I, now I have a book habit. I buy um, a lot of books, too many books, but all of these books are really instrumental in actually building the, the syllabus. But overall, some of the main goals for me of the syllabus was to decolonize um, my syllabus. So trying to find opportunities that weren't just built within <clears throat> the colonial conquest of Western society. So 
de-westernizing and decolonizing went together. And so a lot of that was pooling references. One of the things I realized, and especially from being a grad student myself, was that the classes were very diverse in terms of where the regions and countries everyone was coming from. But I often saw that the professors would always use the same examples, whether it's the Bauhaus or a Swiss design, and never really start to pull from different trains of thoughts, Eastern design, um, even looking at some indigenous design. And so part of it, part of my goal was to find those opportunities to be able to highlight um, non-Western design and actually um, decolonialize the, the entire canon that we we're examining. Uh, another goal was to actually bring in gender into design, moving beyond patriarchy, moving beyond the same white males that you see all the time and actually finding opportunities to highlight as many uh, gender non-binary, as many um, women as possible, and to really start to show that design is so expansive, but in the way how we start to teach it, in the way how we start to approach it, there's many opportunities to find ways to connect to people beyond what's usually served up. And then lastly was just looking at systems of oppression and really making sure that those systems of oppression were actually um, helped us to guide through different sections. So not skirting away from concepts of ableism, of racism, of sexism, but actually looking at what is the role of the designer within these systems? Like how have these systems either been dismantled or perpetuated based off of design? And so from there, I had a pretty good foundation um, that excited me. I was excited. For, for the class. Um, and what I decided to do was, well, I still needed to frame the class in a way that made sense and that made each section start to connect to each other. So the way how I framed it was in this notion of conflicting worlds, which I was inspired by Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategies. And the idea of conflicting worlds is that we all live in three different worlds at the same time. So there's a world that we live in, there's a world that we're building, and there's a world that we're um, imagining. And so the world that we live in is all about the context, right? It's all about the context of how did we get to where, where, where we are? What are the systems and things that we end up taking for granted and that we've adopted? And so the goal was to examine um, those systems, the goals were to examine those notions and try to find opportunities to really think critically about the things that we consider to just be the norm. And so the first class in that section was designing for the real world. And designing for the real world was really looking at what is the role of the designer in society and how does the designer either react or help to push society in a different way. And this was really interesting because the book that we um, really rooted in was, it's called, Are We Human? And the whole notion is looking at actual, like archeology span as a way to examine design. And one of the key takes away was that actually archeology, span actually design is what makes us human and our ability to adapt and change our environment is what makes us, um, to be human as opposed to non-humans, animals who can adapt their environment in certain ways, but um, design is actually what allows humans to do that to a larger scale for better and for worse. And from understanding design in the real world, rooting um, the designer in society um, and connecting the two, we move to design and intent, right? Like, the, what is the intent of the designer? How does the intent of the designer start to shape what the output is? And even this screen grab was us talking about perspective and how perspective um, influences your intent. So you can design and create something that is supposed to do one thing, but then has um, other things that it does. And how, and is it the designer's responsibility once something is produced, once the artifact or the design or the output is produced, um, is it their responsibility to continue on, um, I guess, nurturing their output and actually shifting it? So 
one example would be Facebook, right? Is it um, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg's um, responsibility or YouTube's responsibilities that um, these platforms have been used to radicalize or spread disinformation? A lot of the classes, I would say a lot of the classes were, there were a lot of, there was a lot of silence. And I built the class to be a lot of silence. And I also informed my students that I was comfortable with silence and they should grow comfortable with silence because the questions that were being asked were very, I guess, theoretical, but also philosophical questions that there weren't clear cut answers. But I always encouraged everyone to take a moment to actually like think through what they wanted to say and also take a chance and be wrong and not always agree. So there was um, a lot of great healthy debates for us to really start to think through, uh, especially with this one, like what is the role of designer past producing the artifact and where does intent come into that? Next, we started talking about everyday objects, right? So once again, this was, these students are industrial designers. And so we started really thinking about like what are the objects that we take on in our everyday and even this this slide is funny because part of it is thinking about what is normal and what is accepted and there is a certain air to i guess um mundanity and things that things that are non-design and so what we were discussing was like how do things become non-design how do things become so ubiquitous for our everyday life that we don't even think about the the aspect of design of it and one of the really cool things was was this was able to shift and be rooted in a lot of eastern philosophy so pulling from eastern designers that actually don't only look at the object but actually look at how the object um, affects the atmosphere and affects the entire room. So not just looking at design based off of one aspect, but actual design rooted in context. And so that's what this section really became about, was more not just the artifact, but more of the context of, of design. And then we moved into contemporary design. What is good design? How did we get good design? Who gets to dictate what is good design? Is Dieter Rams' 10 points of good design the only thing that is good design? And also this really opened up doors for us to talk about what's the difference between a designer, a craft person, and an artisan? And why do certain people get to be designers while other people um, are more artisans? And so even with this slide, like this was starting to show that the contemporary modern clean Scandinavian design is something that was inherited, that we all inherited and we all adopted and deemed to be the pinnacle of design. And the class was really like, why? Where does that come from? And then what starts to happen when we all start to see in the same way and it starts to flatten out the, the world? And also knowing that everything that sits outside of this approach is considered something else or is considered bad design. So that wrapped up the section of the world that we lived in and the world that we inherited and the systems that we inherited. So then we moved into the world that we're building. And so this was really meant for us to, once we understand, now let's start to see what are some contemporary designers doing to either dismantle or help to uphold and perpetuate the various systems that, that we discussed. And so the first one was a spicy one, decolonizing design. And this class, I remember I, I framed it up to everyone. I was like, this is going to be an uncomfortable class. And we, sh we can all accept that it's uncomfortable because there's notions that are in here that really start to um, dismantle and start to pull away at the things that we consider um, to be normal. And what this gave us a lot of um, opportunity to do was actually start to really have discussions about the, the root of colonization within design, the root of slavery, the root of global conquest from different nations, and how that starts to permeate the way how we approach design. Um, in addition to that, like how our aesthetics translated across different communities, but then also appropriation and what role does that start to play in design and what role do designers um, play within that? 
Next, we did a really cool, and I'll say this is probably the weirder of the sections, and I was really excited about it. We spoke about liminal spaces. We spoke about the, the idea and the concept of being in a space of unknown and how might designers actually start to use and leverage this, this notion of liminality and moving through spaces um, instead of being afraid of it, actually use the unknown as a means of inspiration and use it as a means of um, helping to solve problems based off of being in this liminal space and not having the constraints of the context of the world to create something new. And the, we had a guest lecturer for this one, um, a woman named Dominique, who has a uh, architect practice that is between Berlin and Accra, Ghana, and it's called Limbo Accra. And what was really cool was that she presented about how there's so many spaces, um, private residential spaces in Accra, Ghana, in West Africa, that um, have been erected and built by um, people who live abroad, either in Europe or in the US, in which I have a personal experience with that with my parents um, sending money back home to build their homes, but showing that some people don't actually reach that full dream of building out their homes. So there's throughout neighborhoods, you will have big erected, mini mansions, but then you would also have these carcasses of half erected homes that are in limbo, that are in these liminal spaces where they're started, but they're not completed. And which for me really hit home and representing um, this idea of liminality. And especially like looking at my parents who, you know, consider Liberia home or other foreigners who consider elsewhere home, but then live in the United States in order to provide for themselves and their family and still being in this in-between and never really fully settling. And so this class was a really interesting and fun class to start to talk through and dive through. And yeah, this screen grab was, uh, was a screen grab that I put in the presentation um, that I found weird if you just search liminal spaces on Instagram, you'll come up with a lot of creepy spaces that are unsettling. Next, we spoke about social practice in which social practice is definitely near and dear to my practice and how I work. And so what this was, was looking at social practice, which is the art form that isn't just about an output, but more about the an engagement with the community and, and actually starts to blur the lines between an artist and someone who works within a city planning position um, and some sort of professional position that engages with the welfare of a community. And so what we we're trying to do here was actually comparing this art practice to design and trying to learn about how this art practice that's meant to drive engagement starts to influence design. And what does engagement from a community level look like for a designer? And how can design actually start moving past just producing, but actually be more responsible to communities that it's engaging with? Uh, the next class was about regenerative and ecology design. And what was really interesting here was we really went back to the roots and the foundation of sustainability. Sustainability is a word that's thrown around all the time, especially in design. It is a topic that design is um, very much into. And so for us, I wanted us to start to just examine where does sustainability come from? How has it evolved? And does it still have value? Is it um, a, a value proposition that designers should continue to hold on and perpetuate? Um, and in that, I, I feel like there was really a, a fruitful discussion of what are the limits of sustainability? Like what are the, the limits of how designers perpetuate um, participate in sustainability? And is there a, a alternate way to think about um, ecology and engaging with our environment? And so then that wrapped up the world that we're building and we move into my favorite section, the world we uh, are imagining, right? So the world that we imagine. And so we started off with the context of 
um, all the systems that we had inherited, we moved into starting to understand what are some of the topics that are happening now and some of the practitioners that are either challenging or perpetuating those systems. And now we're disconnecting from, uh, from our current reality and really starting to think towards the future, really starting to root ourselves into the actual um, future and thinking boundlessly. And so the first topic that we spoke about was actually a continuation from the previous topic that was about ecology and sustainability and starting to look at more future ways of how sustainability and regenerative design is being produced. And this really started to look at biomimicry and what are some of the key tenets that will allow us to move beyond sustainability and start to move into this era of regenerative design and where does the designer um, role play with, within that? This conversation was also a challenging one as well because I feel like saying or or proposing that there's an opportunity beyond sustainability sometimes doesn't sit well with everyone because we've been trained to think that sustainability is the, the end all and all be all. The next class that was supposed to happen was a class that was about practices of care and dignity. Um, where does dignity start to fit into design? How can dignity be built into the output? How can dignity be built into the bottom line? That ended up being scratched. And one thing I learned throughout teaching this class was flexibility. Flexibility was, was built into it. And there was a word that kept coming up every single class that I felt would be a disservice to me and the students if we didn't focus on that word. And that was capitalism. Capitalism and, and financial systems kept on coming up. And I realized along with the rest of the class, that the filter and the lens that we're operating through is through a capitalistic lens and, and, and system. So we needed to talk about capitalism. I was fortunate enough to bring in um, a, a constant collaborator that I have, a woman named Isita, who has a background in design thinking, human-centered research, but also economics. And we like went back to what, is capitalism how does capitalism work within the different systems how have we evolved what role has design played within capitalism um, including examining the Bauhaus and the Bauhaus's school of thought and ability to to not only look at art and design but also infuse that into production where does production come into that. And because we're looking at future systems, then we start looking at alternatives to capitalism, alternative ways to start to organize capital and resources um, that could um, be viable in the future. And then we're supposed to have another class about the business of design. But at that point, since I already threw out the entire syllabus, I decided that it would make more sense to do uh, speculative design. So looking at futuring, looking at how can we use the ability to help to coerce the future, um, to create a better future and to create intention um, around the future. This one was great because we, we got to talk about Sun Ra, um, who is an Afro, Afro futurist and someone that um, I often reference in a lot of my work, but I know that the students who I engage with as industrial designers hadn't had that much experience or exposure to speculative design um, or featuring as a design practice. And so it was one that allowed us to start to bring in many different types of influences, many different types of approaches um, that the students found to be very interesting and very engaging. And so that wraps up like the entire course and how the course was laid out and i know you want okay well how do you grade this how does this like what does this conclude to and where we ended up landing um both with the midterm and the final was ted talks the simple notion that ideas are worth spreading and so how we set it up was that for the midterm um the students wrote a manifesto so 
throughout the entire class, there were many different topics and themes that we spoke about, but the entire goal was for them to be able to develop a perspective, to be able to develop and communicate a perspective. So the first step to that was having them create um, manifestos in which the manifesto's goal was to root them in the driver's seat of design. And once we had the manifestos established, um, we workshopped them. And for the final, it was to give a, a TED talk. It was to be able to sway and compel everyone else to sign up for your future of design. And but your future of design isn't just design, it's the future of the society, it's the future of the world. And what my main goal and my main agenda was for the class was to show the students that everything that you take for normal, you have inherited. You have um, taken on these systems from previous designers, um, previous politicians, but you have the opportunity to shape and create the future that you want to see. It all starts with you understanding and being able to communicate out your idea and being able to do that in a way that is compelling. And thus that starts to influence your output and your final design. And so what I would love to leave everyone with is a quote that I kept flashing every single class, or I would say, yeah, I would probably like say every single class. And it came from a tweet that I saw that stuck with me. History is written by the victors. Science is written by the funded. So my question to you is who writes design? Thank you. And that is it. Wow, that, uh, that was a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to actually talk to us about this. Um, and it's, I saw the other day you, you had kind of like written a post saying, this is getting meta that we're now talking about uh, to a design school about the design. And it's, it's interesting how it, even the course itself, it sounds almost like this whole cyclical process of like going around in a circle. And now at the end, that TED talk is their learnings are now being brought back as a form of teaching um yeah. i just and i just really like that that idea but um one of the things that i noticed too is that there's a lot of parallels um that there's a lot of that there's a lot of parallels uh with the dean journal the class uh this discussion uh and the idea of really like thought provoke asking yourself thought provoking questions looking inside and really reflecting and this idea of conversation kind of leads leads learning um, yeah. And one thing that uh, I really liked is that idea of asking questions. So my question to you um, mm -hmm. is, uh, as young designers, how do we better ask questions in order to kind of avoid just learning the surface level of, of things from people, like people, ideas, concepts, communities, uh, in order mm -hmm. to dive deeper? So it's not like just this basic ground level. Yeah, I, I would say um, it starts with your personal interest, right? Because I, I think what ends up happening is we see a projection of what is a designer or what is a professional, and then we try to conform to that, right? And we do research in order to be that. And so our questions are geared towards what is the best way? What is the best typeface to create Swiss design or things like that, as, as opposed to trying to make sure that we're centering ourselves and our practice um, within our approach. And I, I know that earlier on, the best way to learn is by mimicking, but then there comes a point where in your, in your mimicking, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, who am I? How am I informing this? Where am I in this design? And which there's a difference between um, designing for yourself and designing for an audience and designing for, for a client. But at the end of the day, we all have various filters. We all, information comes in and then we all are able to craft our perspective, but our perspective has to be rooted in us and the things that we're interested in. So it may be rooted and it doesn't necessarily have to be rooted in the history 
of Bauhaus or different type movements. It could be um, rooted in streetwear, it could be rooted in music. And so even in my class, a lot of the references I did not pull from the typical design canon because what I wanted to show was that there's actual inspiration and connection across everything. And it's really up to you to connect those dots. Awesome. And and I mean, there is such a wide variety of information that seems to be in this class. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't even know how to begin, but how would you go about like, like choosing what you think is going to be of most value to the students through the topics? And, and is this stuff that you've had previous knowledge on and, or is it kind of also a, a step, taking a step back and now learning again from people that are around you? Cause it seems as though collaboration is like a very big part of your process. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll let you in on, on a secret. Part of the reason why I wanted to do it was because I wanted to learn. None of the topics, I mean, I wouldn't say none of them, but most of the topics I'm not an expert at and I didn't want to be an expert at. And one of the things that I did in the class was set it up to be, uh, set it up so that it wasn't me as the professor who has all the answers, but me more as a facilitator who is asking questions and then we're all contributing um, to that. And so in navigating even the syllabus, those were just topics that either I'm like, oh, by listening out there in the world and seeing what's in the social zeitgeist, here are topics that are relevant right now. And then also here are topics that I'm really interested in. So there was topics that it was hard because there was a lot of things I had to cut out. Like there was things about like singularity that I was super interested in. But I think at the end of the day, the goal was to be able to weave a narrative that was compelling, that was current, but then also gave enough foundation for us to be able to have rich discussions. And and you'd mentioned that uh, you had like these debates on on these different topics. And is there is there something or a student or an idea that came about that maybe had changed your mind in an idea or concept? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was there was often times that I would ask a question and then the question would be reframed. Right. Mm -hmm. The question like uh, a student would say, yeah. You, uh, I think the capitalism one was one of them, like that pivot to speak about capitalism was often that I would ask, like, does design have, like, what is the role of the designer? And then I would, it would be reframed as what is the role of the designer within capitalism? And then I learned like, oh, yeah, you're right. Within this system that we're, we're talking about, the there's production and there's output and the designer's role may be optimized to that. And so then what that allowed us to do is start to think, okay, well, what happens beyond that? Like how, how do we start to think beyond capitalism? And the only way for us to do that is like, first let's just dissect it and talk about what capitalism is. That's great. And I'm sure, I guess, just from your agency as well, um, you probably had, I guess, clients that um, you've had like that, I guess, that, that space where you can sense that there is a, like capitalism and this like PR of like, okay, everyone's kind of focusing on this specific issue. We needed to jump on it. Um, and like, how, how do you go about kind of taking a step back with the client and being like, Hey, we're not, we're not providing value for this specific community. Um, we, you need to look at things a little bit different. It's almost as though you have to teach now to like these, these bigger name brands. Yeah, I mean, that is the name of the game when you have clients, because um, a lot of times what happens is that the client comes in with a pretty narrow scope based off of what their current issue is, right? Based off of what their current need state is. And I think part of the design approach is to help reframe and broaden out and show it in a more systems like that's why i mentioned systems thinking like mm -hmm. not about this one thing or this thing it's about how the two interact and so part of our role as designers and researchers is to be able to help root this problem and connect it to a broader issue that then what we can do is actually say oh well solving this is only the symptom of this much bigger context let's actually start talking about the much bigger context so that then we can make sure that the solution that we are designing for is inclusive it is sustainable and it is something that actually adds value 
and not just something that is superficial and just um, reactionary. Mm -hmm. And and has there like, I guess I want to say, how do you really tell that you've been fully exhausted in this process? Like, how does there a point where strategy and strategy or research and strategy now begins and that you're kind of happy with it? Um, just even from like personal, personally going through the thesis project, it's like looking back on it and reflecting and even I was lucky enough to get a Dean journal like two days ago, just to like flip through and, and read some of the articles and already like the ideas are things like, Oh, I might've left something out or maybe I can change this. How do you, how do you really navigate the, the notion of like, am I being exhausted with my research and strategy? Well, I think um, uh, to quote one of my partners in Dean Marquise Stillwell from open box, um, perfection is always too late. And so part of the design, process needs to be iteration. And the only way you can iterate is by actually sharing, um, actually starting to share out um, the concepts and at least prototyping. So regardless of like, I don't think you will ever fully exhaust research, um, but I think it's up to you as a designer to at least get to the point that you have a viable prototype and you have enough inputs from the viable prototype. So usually what we do um, on the Room for Magic side and also on the Deem side is we have like a, a matrix that we play around with in order to um, understand. And our checklist is, is if we're looking at community, what are the needs, the wants, desires, and the pain points? Right, and also what are the stimulus um, for said community and what data can we get from that and how close can we get to the actual um, community? And sometimes we embed community members on our, on our team. Um, and so then you have that aspect, but then if it's like a client that we're working with, um, we're looking at what's happening internally, what's happening externally. So what may be, what may be happening um, with adjacent companies, entities, but then also then what's happening contextually, what is happening in the world that is informing what's happening internally and externally, and then how can we navigate the two? But I think if I had a final answer, it would be that there's you're never done with the research, but in order to move forward, you need a prototype that you can iterate on. So you need to find what are those guardrails that you wanna set up that, um, or those thresholds that you feel will give you enough to at least have a viable um, first iteration. Mm -hmm. And what is like the, I understand you constantly trying to create value for communities and how do you really have that discussion of figuring out what what value is for specific communities? And yeah, you and, yeah, and uh, I think a lot of that is like I said, actually talking to the community, but not only empathizing with them, but actually bringing them to the table, actually having their voice be truly represented, whether that is a actual community member that has no experience in design research that we embed on our team and actually has as much say and equity in the process, or even um, finding ways to bring about like using qualitative interviews that we're not editing, but we're um, compiling and curating in order to paint a much broader image of what the community's wants, needs, desires, and pain points may be. And is, I, I love one of the things that you've said before is that your favorite designers are your parents. Um, yeah. The idea of like, they had to establish a framework to live in the States. Um, and um, the idea of even Dean and focusing on process on that first issue and of everyone can be a designer is something of like a great uh, notion. Um, so I just, uh, I wanted to ask more about uh, the process, if I can find my question here now, as I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so how is process, I guess, crafted? Um, it seems as though it, it comes from lived experiences. Um, or is it something that's more of like a step-by-step -step process once you've kind of figured it out? Um, I, I think process is something that is always developing. It should always be um, developing. And which uh, I think I said earlier that a process, um, you could establish a process by 
mimicking and studying another process so at least get a foundation of it. But then as you start to master that process, you should always be auditing your process and always in be interested in other processes that are within your practice, your field, but then also outside of your field for, for inspiration and find new ways to, to iterate. And so I would even say like my process may have started more rooted in design thinking and rooted in the methodologies of executing design thinking, but now have moved more um, to adopt more social practice. And what does that look like to, to create community art and engagement? Um, yeah. And because you're coming from a place of strategy, it's something that a lot of us, I guess, early in design school, we go into a, a place of, of doing design because of like the love for art or we feel creative and strategy isn't something that's really thought of. Um, and it's funny, so we complain there's, oh, there's too much text on the page. Like, can we get rid of some of it here? How do I highlight something a little bit uh, better? Uh, I don't have the space for it. Um, coming from your background, how do you balance allowing the content to speak first versus the the design nature of it. I know even for like Dean Journal, there's just definitely like a structure to it to allow the stories to speak. But then you also have this element of of color that that brings out like the liveliness of the interviews or the photography. I know you'd mentioned before that it was um, focus, focused on um, um, like really like you're in the room with the person. Um, so how do you go about making those decisions yeah i would say I, I i um this is a secret between all of us on on <laughs> this platform but i i do have a background in graphic design um i have a minor in it and the reason why i don't tell people is because then friends and family want me to design logos and flyers <laughs> for things and i'm like <laughs> no <laughs> i'm like no yeah. Uh, like, oh, it's, it's just going to be quick. Can you like quickly yeah. put this out? Like, no, I, I can't. Um, but so with that, uh, I think I've been fortunate enough through my background of marketing and working at brands and then especially my understanding of design aesthetics um, and then moving into a place of, of strategy. Um, I actually was pushing my students to help to adopt more strategic thinking, because at the end of the day, in order to sell your approach, you need to be able to you need to be able to lay out a compelling narrative. And so, in my mind, the strategy is the why, not the what. It's the why. And if you start from the why, you can still make the why look beautiful and compelling, and choose the right type pairing for it. But if you don't start from the why, and it's just purely the what, um, your foundation isn't as as strong. And yeah. so I, I don't think every designer needs to go into an intensive strategy boot camp, but I do think it will help you if you if you're a person who you're you really like your ideas and your executions, and then you wonder, man, how come the creative director didn't choose it or the client hated it? Then strategy would really help you to be able to sell your your vision. And that's how I think of strategy. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that as or like early designers, we struggle with uh, as well. It's funny too, like I wrote in big letters why on my paper as, as the presentation was going on. Uh, mm -hmm. And always that constant like, okay, why? And when you get that answer, ask again, why? And when you get that answer yeah. again, ask why? And it, it allows you to dive deeper. All right, we're, we're wrapping up soon. Uh, I have one last question, but I'm gonna quickly ask, uh, the audience for one of theirs. Um, so we can load one up. Do you have the syllabus posted anywhere? I would love to use it as a reference point for self-reflection as a designer. Ro, I do have it posted. Um, I could share it. Um, it is on my Google Drive. I can put it into my arena designing design board. Um, if there's a way that I can link that board to everyone, I will drop the syllabus in there and have at it. That's great. And do you, is there any like smaller resources maybe that we can even just look into? Um, um, the, the, the designing design arena board that I created is like my central repository of like anything that I think 
intersects with design, design education. I usually just drop things in there. So if you're on Arena, I would say follow it. Um, there is Teaching Design, which is a, a Instagram, which is an Instagram handle that I I follow. That's that's really good. And then also the the Dean Journal um, Instagram handle is also just as awesome for for resources. Awesome. And my last question. So uh, I did a bit of a deep dive on YouTube, uh, and I found uh, a YouTube profile from like twelve years ago. <laughs> oh wow! You you told me you were going to try to nar ward me. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, so in in that video, you said in two weeks I'm going to be done with school, and for now I'm going to be working at whatever company that was there, um, doing uh, lifestyle marketing. From there, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing, but I'm gonna find my place in life. And since then, obviously, your profession, professional career has definitely shifted in so many ways. And as us students are kind of in that exact position of like 2008 new, um, what are your tips for steering your path in finding your um, path in life or your, your space in life? How do you, do you feel as though you found that space or is it a constant state of learning and the alchemist style of like finding your omens? Yeah. You know, you know, what's super interesting about that video and that class was that class was taught. So my undergrad, I did uh, a dual major in marketing and management, uh, minor in graphic design. And that class was the last class is you could only take it in your senior year and no one knew what that class was, but you had to take it to pass. And it was Professor Moser who taught it and he would sit in the front of the class and he would talk with his hands and he was just like super neurotic and he would just like point out issues with everything. And he'd be like, you know what annoys? And he would just like go on like a Larry David brand and he would, <laughs> and he would have you do these assignments where like you would go into the cafeteria and you would like take notes on things that you think can be improved. It wasn't until probably when I taught my class that I realized that that class was a design thinking class years ago that didn't have the name design thinking and couldn't really be phrased up. And so everyone was just like, yeah, we have to take this class that doesn't make any sense to us, but we took it anyway. So that video is one of the videos I had to make for that class. And so to answer your question in terms of tips for navigating, I'd say use your intuition the of what works for you um learn as much as possible always be open to to learning and one of the main things that helps propel me is your engagement and what you're doing is based off of your perspective and what that means is that if you are engaged in something and let's say if i came to you and i said hey this weekend I have this like freelance project. Are you interested in, in doing it? If you are engaged, you would be like, yeah, of course I want to do it because I see the opportunity in it. A disengaged person, when you ask the same question, will find it as a burden. No, why would I want to work on the weekend? And so I'm not saying that you should kill yourself and work on the weekend, but I'm saying as you make decisions, check in with yourself to see what your engagement is and what your perspective is in your response and know that the, the what's being asked of you is pretty it's it's pretty object well yeah it's pretty objective but your response is subjective based off of you and how you are feeling and so you should check in with that when making decisions amazing that's the greatest thing to end on. So thank you so much. Um, up next is the Cove Collective, and they're going to be talking about uh, building community through design, which I believe has already started because we've been gone a bit over time, but it's all right. Um, so thank you so much uh, again for coming and sharing your insights. It's been amazing. Cool. Thank you. Bye.